Thank you very much, Brother Seth, for leading us in that scripture reading. And I also want to thank Bill. You know, I, I really appreciate that message in song. Uh, I love to hear his voice. You remind me of uh, some others that I've heard. You're very talented, and I appreciate that. And I just want to invite you at this time, you know, to bow your heads with me. Uh, there's a lot that I have to say, so I just want to get right on in uh, to the message uh, this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, uh, for the blessing of just being able to come together again. We ask that you will guide us, be with us, help us, Lord, to understand the ins and outs of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. I'm going to move this just a little bit closer. Ah, okay. I'd like to turn your attention to Galatians 5 and verse 1. And the word of God says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. A particular interest in religious liberties comes quite natural for Seventh-day Adventists. We consider ourselves to be a people of prophecy, both because of our origin and the emphasis that we place on the predictive passages of scripture. And of special interest to us is the one that's found in Revelation 13 and verse 11, where the word of God says, and I saw another beast coming up where? Out of the earth. Suggesting that some other beast had come up before it. And it had two horns like a lamb, and it spake as a dragon. In Revelation 13, 11, is foretold the rise of the United States of America at the right place, at the right time, and also with the right characteristics. And this is the first time in biblical prophecy, with the exception of Revelation 11, where a nation is represented by a non-carnivorous beast. All of the other nations prior was represented by vicious carnivorous beasts. But here we have a beast that have lamb-like qualities. And we are told in verse 12 that this particular beast of the United States will begin to change. It will begin to exercise all of the power of the first beast that's mentioned in Revelation 13. But let's take a look at it. Let's look at the 13th verse here. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doth great wonders so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And then we read in verse 14 where the word of God says, And deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which hath the wound by a sword and did live, saying to them. Now saying to them comes from a Greek word that means to make legislation. This is not the normal word for saying. It means to make legislation. And so we're talking about a power that would legislate. We're talking about a power that would move from being that of a protector of human rights uh, to a despotic power that we've seen in bygone years. And you know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs the 14th chapter and verse 34, it says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, which leads into the subject matter of my message this morning. All of the great nations have crumbled into the dust of history, have been blown away by the winds of time, the glory and the splendor of Egypt is all but history now. The Assyria of Sennacherib is buried in the desert. The Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar has long since fallen. 
the Persia of Darius and Artaxerxes, the Grecian kingdom, and then the Roman Empire. Kingdom after kingdom has come and gone. And now here we stand, the United States of America, the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. How long will it be before we too are blown away by the winds of time and crumble? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. But let's look back in history. You know, Samuel Adams, he wrote a letter to a friend declaring, no group of people in any age has enjoyed the privilege of sitting down at a table, looking over all of the plans of government and choosing one that they believe to be best. No other people have had that privilege. Our founding fathers, sitting at a table in Philadelphia 200 years ago, reached across the centuries and selected the most coherent, the most practical, the most rational and elegant ideas ever possessed by the minds of men. They began with the timeless ideas of Judeo-Christian tradition that all men come from one creator, made of one blood, all nations to dwell upon the face of the earth. They looked at the prophets of Jerusalem and the scholars of Athens. They borrowed from the Roman law of Caesar Augustus and the sense of charity and vocation from the Christian church. They picked up the accent on man, the genius that flowered from the time of the Renaissance and lifted individual liberty from the Reformation and the concept of political self-determination from the mind of John Locke. And with this rich heritage of ideas, the Founding Fathers brought together 13 colonies that became the United States of America. And soon after that, by the grace of God, they were able to break free from the tyranny of Great Britain. And so here we are today, 2020, still enjoying our freedoms. Freedom of assembly, freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. The Constitution of the United States government tells us that we can worship God according to the dictates of our conscience. Come on and say amen. amen. But it's important for us to recognize that the persecutions that existed in bygone years in other nations because of a lack of freedom is one day going to be experience of God's people right here in the United States. And it doesn't surprise me what Jesus was trying to get across his disciples in John, the 15th chapter, in the 16th chapter. He talks about a hatred that the world is going to have for God's people. It is a hatred that the world have because they are like him. But we find in the 16th chapter of John, particularly verses 1 and 2, I want to bring your attention. The word of God says... Jesus says, these things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogue, yea, the time cometh, that whoever killeth you will think that they are doing God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. And so the Bible is saying that people will kill thinking that they're doing God a service. And I've asked myself the question, why did Jesus tell his disciples this at such a critical moment in their lives? And it comes to me that there was three messages that I believe that Jesus was trying to get across to his disciples. First of all, he wanted his disciples to understand the nature of religious liberty. He wanted to recognize them to recognize that even amongst his own disciples, there were religious bigots. Right. And one disciple in particular thought that the only ones that were going to be saved in God's kingdom were the Jews. They were the only ones that had the bona fide right to enter therein. Jesus wanted his disciples to understand that religious bigotry can be a very evil thing. And religious bigotry can grow and grow and grow and reach such monstrous proportions that people can commit some of the most inhumane acts and think that they are doing something very good, something that God approves of, something that is helpful. And when we look in the history of the world, we find out that most of the persecutions that were initiated were not initiated by people outside of the church. They were initiated by people in the church. 
in the 19 and the 1660s or the uh, 1600s when the Puritans came over to the shores of this land. They wanted to make everybody pure, everything good. But there was a group of Baptists and, and Quakers that wanted to dwell with them. And the Puritan says, hit the road. You, you got till sundown to get out of Dodge. And the Baptists were able to read the handwriting on the wall. They left. But the Quakers decided, we're not going anywhere. They came back, and eight of them were lynched. And these were good people. These were religious people. These were people that wanted to purify a group and make everybody else good just like them. And so we need to understand that as Christians, as Christians, the greatest danger is not going to come from the communists, not the atheists, not the folks that want to get prayer and Christmas out of the school system, but the greatest danger comes from good people, church folks, that want to make this a Christian nation. And I'm concerned about the changes that are taking place in our, in our organization, in our, Christian, in our Christian church. Organizations, Christians, are working to overturn the present structure of this country. Now, there's nothing wrong with Christianizing a nation as long as you go about doing it the right way. Winning a nation to Christ voluntarily is one thing, but using laws and government to try to compel morality and advance the cause of religiosity is something altogether different. Back a number of years ago, before some of you were born, the former President Ronald Reagan you know, during his second term, two months into his second term, there was a representative of the, uh, of the religious right movement. A person, some of you probably remember, Jerry Falwell. And what was Jerry Falwell seeking? We want laws. We want laws, the moral majority. And the main objective of the righteous, these people that were backing Jerry Falwell, to was to improve the land that had drifted away from God. And when you, when you listen to them, they sound so good. They were pro-American. They were pro-family. They were strong supporters of the commonwealth of Israel. They were against homosexuality. They were against abortion. And people were drawn to what they were saying by the droves. Even members of our own church was getting their blessing on Sunday morning, turning on the television and rocking re and reeling with Jimmy Swaggart. <laughs> and then the, the government finally ended up shutting down Jerry Falwell. They ended up revoking his 501c3 status. See, that's the danger when a church begins to get involved politically. When he lost his 501c3 status, he had to pay taxes on everything that he owned. And after a while, you didn't hear another peep from Jerry Falwell. If they were to revoke our 501c3 status, we would have to pay well over a billion dollars for all of the assets that we own. But today, Jerry Falwell is peacefully resting in his grave. He died in 2007, but I want you to know that there's a heap of folks that's carrying on his legacy. Preachers like Pat Robinson, Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, you know, and many of them are Catholics in disguise hovering around the White House. There is a real danger when you mix religion with politics. But I would just like to shift my gears a little bit because we've been talking about the second beast of Revelation 13. But we need to say something about the first piece. When Pope Francis came to the United States, speaking to a joint session of Congress, he made a statement in reference to the common good. How many of you are familiar with that? The common good is a Roman Catholic social teaching, and Pope Francis stated that the common good has to become global. And this business of the common good was also the top agenda item when he addressed the United Nations in the same period. In this encyclical letter, 
officially referred to as Lotto C, he addressed leaders of every nation telling them that they must, not that they may, but they must give up national interests national sovereignty for the common good. In other words, he was telling them that individual personal liberties must give way, must be surrendered for globalism in order for everybody to live together as one. And while researching this subject of the common good, you know, I ran across somebody that raised a question stating, is Catholic attrition, uh, uh, tradition supporting this Spockian philosophy that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one? And so they were conditioning us through television a long time ago. Well, the answer to that question is absolutely yes. When the Pope speaks about the common good, who is he quoting from? He's actually quoting from a 12th century Catholic priest by the name of Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas stated that the death penalty can be applied in order to safeguard, in order to preserve the common good. His exact words are right here. This is what he says. Therefore, if a man be dangerous and infectious, to the community on account of some sin, it is praiseworthy and advantageous that he be killed in order to safeguard what? The common good. When Pope Francis made that statement about the common good being necessary, he was speaking of that in conjunction with climate change. And within the same context, he was talking about a Sunday law. In other words, he was saying that in order for there to be a climate action taking place, a Sunday law must be enforced in order for the climate to get better. And all nations must accept this Sunday law. Now keep in mind that this is not the first time that the Roman Catholic Church sought to enforce a Sunday law. During the early years of our country, Sunday laws, also known as blue laws, were legislated and enforced on the state level. Those who violated these blue laws by working on Sunday, they were fined and imprisoned. In the 1880s, there were many Seventh-day Baptists and Seventh-day Adventists that were thrown into jail or fined because they worked on Sunday. <laughs> but the 1888 folks that were trying to implement a Sunday law on the federal level were Roman Catholic infiltrators who had banded together with apostate Protestants under the guise of the common good. And then May 21, 1888, a senator by the name of Henry Blair introduced Bill 2983, the National Sunday Rest Bill, to Congress. And that's when A.T. Jones, a representative of the, of the Adventist Church, went into action, thank God. He was able to present his argument of opposition to the National Sunday Rest Law before the United States Committee on Education and Labor. The Holy Spirit powerfully used A.T. Jones and the Rest Bill, Sunday Rest Bill, was defeated, thank God. <laughs> so Sunday laws are not something that is new to Americans. Pope Francis, when he talks about a supranational common good must be clearly identified. He's talking about climate change, which automatically necessitates a special legal authority capable of facilitating a solution. And so the question is, 
who are they proposing to be this super national, not natural, but super national authority that will facilitate solutions for climate change? Now, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we know the answer to that question. Come on and say amen. It will be Pope Francis. Remember what we learned in Revelation 13? How the dragon, the devil, gave to this first beast of Revelation 13 is power, seat, and authority? And what does that authority entail according to what Jesus was talking about in Matthew, the eighth chapter, uh, verses nine to uh, five to nine, to give you an idea. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. Now get this. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goeth. And to mother, another man, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. So what are we talking about? So according to Rome, this solution facilitating authority has to have power that is capable of telling somebody, do this, do that, go here, go there, and they must do it. What he's talking about is a government that has the power, the authority, the influence that supersedes the boundaries of a single nation. And according to prophecy, the papacy is going to use the United States government as a hammer to start hammering people into submission. Perhaps I shouldn't say will it is going to, but they are doing it. The United States of America. When every representative of the Supreme Court are Roman Catholic, that is a Roman Catholic state. And I say all nine because the other four or three that claim to be Jewish or something else, they're actually doing the biddings of Rome. Come on and say amen. In other words, we're talking about a power, an authority, and it's not going to be long, brothers and sisters, before an executive order is going to go forth and it's going to activate, it's going to enforce these blue laws that are already on the books. We are living in a time where this can happen at any moment. When Pope showed up at the White House a few years ago in 2015, the Trump administration really, really, really blurred the line of separation between church and state. A lot of documents were signed in order for this beast power uh, 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 to make it really fly. Uh, climate change has to be turned into a moral dilemma or a moral problem necessitating a moral solution. That's why the Bible tells us that the whole world is going to wander after the beast. Prophecy is being fulfilled right before our very eyes. And the revelator makes it very clear that Satan is going to begin passing out his anti-inquisition membership cards for those who want to receive a mark in their forehead or in their hand. Don't forget the Catholic Inquisition Board is still in effect today. However, it goes under a different name. Today it's called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the CDF. This Roman Curia is the administrative apparatus of the Holy See and central governing body of the entire Roman Catholic Church and, and, and it's the oldest among nine medieval councils or courts of justice. The purpose of this Roman Curia is formally known is formally known as the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Roman and Universal Inquisition. That's the original name of it. And it was a purpose of defending the church against heresy and making sure that Catholic doctrine remains. And I repeat. 
this Inquisition Board of the Roman Catholic Church is still in effect today. So when Jesuit Pope France declared a common good mandate must be set up globally, it ought to raise a concern for every sincere Seventh-day Adventist. And we know from our studies that this Sunday Sabbath is going to be made into law toward the close of probation. And at that time, we will either be sealed for salvation or sealed for damnation. Just remember, the uh, common good is a Roman Catholic social teaching. But who is it that determines what the good is for the nations, for the world? When the nations of the world buy into this social teaching, you can kiss goodbye to separation of church and state. We are in the, brothers and sisters, we are in the fungus of the toenails of that Daniel 2 image. That's how, we're, how close we are. In a recent article by the Pope, he made this statement. He said, nationalism raises walls that leads to anti-Semitism or hatred of others. Now, if that's not calling the kettle black, I don't know what is. I read an article in the Southern Union's magazine, The Tidings, entitled, A Beast, Not a Lamb. And the author of that article also condemned nationalism, which caused a red flag in my brain to go up. And the reason why was because both the papacy and this person in this article was condemning nationalism. Some of you may have read that article in January's today, I mean this month's edition of the tidings, but I want to share with you a snippet, a, uh, 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 an excerpt from that article. This is what the author said, and it really doesn't sound bad at all. Nationalism seeks to control and move its power to govern in order to promote its own interests, even to the exclusion and very often the persecution of others' interests. The most egregious, in other words, severe, the most severe case of nationalism in the 20th century was Nazi, the Nazi party's rise to power. As watchmen for religious freedom here in America, we have a growing concern that current trends among evangelicals to take control of the government in order to bring about a more Judeo-Christian friendly state would lead to Christian nationalism. And then it goes on to say, on the front end, this seems like good news. The difference is that the Religious Liberties Department, and thank God for that department, does not try to promote Christianity through the aid of the state. We believe that people of different beliefs should be able to practice their faith according to the dictates of their conscience, just as Christians do. That growing movement in this nation would work to combine religio-political powers that prophecy seems to regard as dangerous in helping to form the image to the beast. Now upon reading this Religious Liberties article in the Tidings, I must agree that nationalism can become a problem, but that depends upon who's behind the curtain pulling the strings. If there is a national Nazi movement that is going on in this country, then every Seventh-day Adventist must know by now that all roads lead to where? It leads to Rome. The Roman Catholic Church funded Adolf Hitler's attempt to take over the world during World War II. That's why they had to apologize to the Jews. 
In order for them to undermine the people's rights in Germany, they needed to get an anti-terrorist bill passed. And how did they go about doing it? By setting the Reichstag. That's like the Capitol building here, ablaze. And then they blamed it on the communists. They blamed it on the terrorists. They blamed it on the Jews. The same thing happened during the Bush administration when the Twin Towers were bombed. As soon as those towers were bombed, all of these anti-terrorist legislations were being crammed on our throats. And brothers and sisters, practically every president, regardless of country or a political affiliation is operating at the behest of Rome. You got to keep that in mind. Even President Obama is a 32nd degree Prince Hall Freemason. His lineage, his, his, his uh, 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 descendancy goes all the way back to the royal family because his, 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 his uh, mother is tied in with the royal family. 33rd, 33rd degree Prince Hall Freemason. So when it comes to the president, don't put a whole lot of stock in who's in office. They're all working together. You know, don't forget, senior Bush's father, Prescott Bush, who was a wealthy American banker and politician, also helped to finance Adolf Hitler's takeover of the world. And since then, we've had two generations of Bushes in the White House. Our liberties, our freedoms, you know, are being eroded every day. And you got to keep in mind that those Twin Towers, they used to be nicknamed David and Nelson. They used to be nicknamed David and Nelson because David and Nelson Rockefeller were the ones that were responsible for building those towers. They supplied the land and the materials. Not only that, but they supplied the land for the building of the United Nations, the Rockefeller family. And the Rockefeller family, just Rockefeller by itself, it means Germany. Look up the etymology of Rockefeller, it means Germany. And I'm not saying I don't have anything against German folks. Matter of fact, one of the best cars I ever owned was an Audi, <laughs> given to me by my brother-in-law. That is not a regular car. That is a machine. <laughs> very, very intelligent people. Very intelligent. Almost took over the world. Well, David Rockefeller at the Club of Rome in 1995, he made a statement. Some of you probably read it. He said, we have an opportunity to bring about the new world order, but if we don't move quickly, we're going to be set back 75 to 100 years. There must be a major catastrophe in order for the nations of the world to accept the new world order. David Rockefeller, you heard of it, you remember that, you read it. That's what he said at the Club of Rome. Some of you may have saw a movie called The Long Kiss Goodnight. <laughs> I don't believe in a whole lot of movies, but three-thirds into that movie, they tell how it was going to be bombed, who was the responsible, with the bombing, and who they were going to blame it on. It's in the movie. A lot of times these folks, they tell you what they're going to do before they do it. In other words, when it comes to the prophetic three angels message, I don't have the luxury, brothers and sisters, to be tiptoeing through the tulips with you. I can't allow the Roman Catholic Church to go unscathed. And so my only argument and my only problem with that article that was written in the tidings is that why don't you put the spotlight on beast number one? You know, the author wrote a good article, but there is no second beast without a first beast. And so the Pope says that all nations must. He's actually talking about the United States of America. And the harsh reality is that Sunday rest laws have already been declared constitutional by the United States Supreme Court many years ago. Technically, Sunday laws are legal in all 50 states. The only thing that it needs is somebody like the President of the United States, to give an executive order to activate it and enforce it. And if you were to read that letter by the Pope, Latter-day Sea, 
and go to section 237, 237. In the Pope's letter where he weaved in Sunday rest, if you were to go to section 179 of the same letter, he adds a provision to enforce it by law. And that's why Revelation 13 and 4, 14 says, And deceive them that dwell on the earth, saying to them that dwell on the earth. As I mentioned, saying means to make legislation. And Pope Francis's climate encyclical, Latter-day Sea, was created to be implemented by law, legislation. This was not simply a letter, a conversation piece for pastors and churches. According to Catholic experts, Latter-day Sea is legislation that they are predicting that's going to take place in the next 10 years or earlier. Is it a coincidence that Rome is pushing Latter-day Sea through over 650 Catholic organizations worldwide. Is it a coincidence that Greta Thunberg is pushing the Pope's climate message down the throat of Americans and other nations around this planet? Now you can't get more low down than that. To use a child, to use children, to try to deceive people, to get them to go along with your dastardly deed. Ellen White stated that this would be the condition of the world toward the end of time. And I want you to consider some of the bold statements that she made over 130 years ago concerning this issue that's in the forefront of us that is going to be issued in in the final crisis. In Great Controversy 606, Thus, the message of the third angel will be proclaimed as the time comes for it to be given with greatest power, that is the latter rain. The Lord will work through humble instruments, thank God, leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. The fearful results enforcing the observance of the church by civil authority, Sunday law, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of papal power, all will be unmasked. And by these solemn warnings, the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like these. Brothers and sisters, we have a work to do to let people know what is coming. It's worthy to notice that when these predictions were made over 130 years ago, the Pope wasn't going around rallying people together to try to bring about a one world government. Today, Rome has achieved what medieval popes could only have dreamed of. Rome has become the spiritual conscience of the world. Rome is the greatest geopolitical influence with regards to spiritual matters. And secondly, Rome's influence today spreads far beyond medieval Western Europe. They are now working to shape the religions and the political landscape of Asia, Africa, Australia, South America, North America, in other words, the entire, entire civil world. The healing of the deadly wound is one of the clearest indications that we are nearing home. It's almost over. And unlike earthquakes, floods, wars, disasters, this healing of the beast happens only one time in Bible prophecy. All nations and entities of power are all coming together and uniting with Rome. Coming back to Mama. Amen. When Ellen White warned us about this threefold union, about Protestants and Catholics coming together, there were no interfaith conversations back then. Ecumenism uh, 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 is a modern phenomena. Protestants and, and, and Catholics only recently have been really engaging in building bridges in the last 60 years. However, 
Inspiration predicts that not only will Protestants and Catholics unite, but that they're going to reach across the gulf and they're going to clasp the hand of spiritualism. This is what it says over here. Great Controversy 588. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp the hands of the Roman power and under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. When that statement was made in 1888, it was incomprehensible that Bible-believing Protestants would form a threefold union entering into collaboration and joint worship service with Roman Catholics, pagans, spiritualists, pantheists, Buddhists, Hindus, witches. But it's happening today. Just as historic Seventh-day Adventist eschatology said it would happen. I want you to listen to what God's servant says in Last Day Events, page 125. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue and many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whether the undercurrent is tending. We also read in Signs of the Time, January 17th, 1884, paragraph 14. They, meaning the leaders, will point to calamities on land and sea, to the storms of wind, the floods, the earthquakes, the destruction by fire, judgments indicating God's displeasure because Sunday is not sacredly observed. These calamities will increase more and more. One disaster will follow close upon the heels of another. And brothers and sisters, I don't mean to belabor this point, but I want you to see how the devil is going to use the Roman Catholic Church and use disasters in order to bring in Sunday legislation. I bring your attention to Great Controversy 589 and 90. This is what she says. Satan worked through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature and he uses all of his power to control the elements as far as God allows. In accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes, and terrific hailstorms, in tempest, flood, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint which is very important for us to remember. And thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon man and beast. And then she quotes from Isaiah 24 verses 4 and 5. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The haunty people do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have done what? Transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. And then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath. That this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. 
and that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. Brothers and sisters, it is important for us to recognize that a Sunday law is coming. First of all, Sunday laws are going to come through stealth, meaning it's going to be a rider. It's going to come in on something else. It's going to come in concealed. And secondly, climate disasters is the main reason for establishing through the papacy the Sunday legislation. The Pope's encyclical letter is a warning against climate, about the climate, and addresses what he calls natural, but I want to say man-made disasters. I don't mean to come off as a mind reader, but I got a feeling that some of you are saying right now, you can't control the weather. Look here, brothers and sisters, weather modification is a Pentagon project called HARP. HARP stands for High Frequency Active Aurora Research Project. And if you were to go to Gakona, Alaska, you would find acres of microwave towers that beam high energy into the ionosphere that is reflected back into the ocean. And when the heat warms up the ocean, it has the potential of creating hurricanes. El Ninos, also these beams are reflected into the earth. It can cause earthquakes. It operates on the same principle a lot of these contractors use with fracking to find oil and, uh, and, and, and gas underneath the ground. All you got to do is do some research on your own. To find out about HARP. There's a lot that's said about it. You know, 25 years ago, when I really began researching this, you know they went into my computer, went into my hard drive, and everything that I saved on this subject, anything that they didn't want, they exited out. They corrupted that file. They don't want you to know about this. And I asked people over and over again, do you know anything about Harp? Do you know anything about chemtrails? And most people says, no, I never heard of it. There are other places around the globe that you will find that weather modification is going on. It's not just in uh, Kokona, Alaska, but you'll find these operations in Australia. They got a big one in Australia. It looks different, but it does the same thing. There's one in Puerto Rico, 15 stations in Ar 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 uh, Antarctica, New Zealand, Chile, Russia has more of these harp stations than any other single country. Especially do you find harp globally positioned where there are rich mineral deposits. And as I stated early, all you got to do, you don't have to take my word for it, go on YouTube. Research harp for yourself. Also, look up chemtrails. Look up Gwen Towers, look up carbon tax, look up the uh, Paris Accord. You know why President Trump didn't go along with the Paris Accord? Let me tell you why. Because he knows that it's fake. They took him up in the planes and they showed him the chemical tanks that are in those planes. He knows that it's fake. He was in the plane. But a lot of pressure is causing him to cave in now. But what does these things do? What are these planes doing? They're spraying our skies like crazy. Haven't you paid any attention? Look at what they're doing. These planes that are spraying, it's not condensation, folks. It's chemicals. It's not contrails for condensation. It is chemtrails for chemicals. They're spraying aluminum oxide. We're breathing it in every single day. Silver iodine, barium that causes cancer. And this stuff is being rained into the earth. Why do you think that some of the trees can't take it when these metals are rained down into the earth? They are dying, you see. Trees where the leaves are supposed to fall off in the fall, they stay on the tree, brown leaves. That is not natural. It's killing plant life. 
<laughs> I don't mean to sound like I'm a nut here, folks. But this stuff is just driving me. How are these criminals getting away with this? Folks, the eyes are useless when the mind is blind. That's our problem. When I used to work in my garden back in 2004, the sun is very important for plants to grow. And I remember I saw two planes fly over, streaks going in the sky, it clouded up, and then the sun was gone. And then year after year, now it's four planes, now it's five planes, now nine planes flying across the sky at the same time, streaking up things. Can't even see the stars anymore at night. Folks, that's not air traffic. Not at all. Planes don't fly like that. It is weather modification. G yes, I heard somebody say it. It's called GEO engineered weather. Geo engineered weather. Anybody know what this is? Gwyn Towers. You know what Gwyn Towers stand for? It stands for uh, Ground Wire Emergency Network Towers. There is absolutely no emergency about these towers. These things send up ELF waves. That's microwaves. You got the big one in Harp that gets things going. Now you got relay stations all the way going south. When you drive that cold air from the polar areas into warm air, you create turbulent weather, you create hurricanes, you create tornadoes, Gwen Towers. And in some parts of the, of, of, of the United States, they try to disguise them so people won't be asking questions. They got one here, this is what they look like. They got one looking like a tree. Yeah, that's funny, huh? And if you notice, they don't have any markings on those things on these towers. Why? Because they belong to the military industrial complex. That's who owned these towers. It has nothing to do with cell phones, folks. It's sending ELF waves up. It is modifying our weather. It is driving cold air into warm air, creating all kinds of problems. If you were to go to Florida, they make them look like palm trees, trying to disguise these things. Why aren't people asking questions? I asked a question because my sister in Niagara Falls got a real big one right in front of her house at the fire department. And I asked the fire, why did you put a tower like that so close to people that live here? You know what he said to me? We don't own them. The land is owned by the military. They own the land. That's their project. You wonder why when you look up, you see the ripple effect in the clouds? It's because those ELF waves are creating ripple effects in the clouds, moving these clouds along. Folks, we need to wake up. The government, you know, this thing is so developed right now, you don't have to worry about getting in trouble looking this stuff up. Because <laughs> they're so far advanced now, they know that there's nothing you can do to stop them. I noticed that they're falsifying the reason why they're doing it now. And now they're saying that, oh, it's necessary for us to, you know, get into geoengineering weather because we got to stop what you're polluting. You're, you're polluting everything with your cars, the CO2 and all of that. CO2 makes trees grow better. They need it like we need oxygen. It's the biggest lie. They're feeding our children at school greenhouse propaganda in the public school system. I hope we're not teaching this in our own schools. The reason why I find HARP sites globally is because the Pentagon, like the CIA, is Roman Catholic. And Catholics are everywhere. That's why they're global. Well, folks, that's about all I have to say. I kind of feel like uh,
Forrest Gump. <laughs> You know, the freight train is going down on the other side of the mountain. But believe me, brothers and sisters, the day is coming when this thing is going to stop. The Word of God promises that. In Revelation 11, in verse 8, the Word of God says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that should give reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. They have their day coming. And people need to understand that the folks understand about politics and government, they will tell you that nothing happens by chance. It is naive for you to think that there is no connection between what I'm telling you and what you've seen in the sky every day and what the Roman Catholic Church is doing is connected to the final battle that is going to happen. You can believe what you want. You can deny it if you want. Bible prophecy will and is being fulfilled. So in closing, I would just like to take some time and just uh, Say until then, we got to continue to stand for what is right. We have religious liberties, representatives in Washington, D.C. that work overtime in our behalf. They go around to Congress and try to persuade them not to vote for legislation that will infringe upon the rights of people to be able to worship God according to the dictates of their conscience. And I often think about the bold stand that Queen Esther took in order to save her people. She said, if I die, I die. We got to get to that point, folks, where we're not afraid to speak the truth. And because of her bold stand, she was able to save a whole group of her people. So ultimately, the message today is the day is going to come when people are going to feel that when they kill, they are doing God's service. But we know God's word. Thank God for the word of God. Because ultimately, we are going to triumph because he has already triumphed. Paul says this about troublous times in Romans 8, verses 17 and 18. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy. Well, you know the rest of it. Don't worry about it, folks. Brothers and sisters, if you suffer for Christ, the promise is sure. You also will be glorified with Christ. Christ went to the cross so that you could have a crown. And if you suffer with him, if you identify with him in your suffering, surely you will join in with the reward that he has to offer. May God help us to stand firm May God help us not to throw in the white towel, but we must continue to fight for what is right. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for the spirit of prophecy. We thank you, Father, for leading us step by step so we can understand exactly what is happening. Because if we don't understand what is happening when all of these things begin to happen, uh, uh, phones and and and. And, and hurricanes and, 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 and tornadoes and destruction and fire. We may be food to go along with this power that is behind the scenes, pulling the strings and deceiving mankind. Father, may we be faithful, open up our eyes. And Father, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.